So, good day everyone. Welcome to Wolves Weekly edition number three. And today it's a great pleasure for me to have uh, with us Mr. Stephen Gartner, who is an SPS alumnus and a business advisory board member. As a chairman of the UK Pension Scheme and also the former CS Director of Investors Relations, he has always been interested in ESG and sustainability. Good day to you, Steve. Good morning, Bert from England, and uh, welcome everybody on the call. Fons, uh, how is how's our biting? Working from home, it's... Uh, taking off it might uh, challenge our business model soon <laughs> exactly so welcome to the new world but Thank you. Uh, the new world actually for the field of sustainable investments and sustainability has it changed a lot or do you think we will continue to go on that same road look i think sustainable investments and the word sustainability have been around a very long time and there's been some amazing changes uh, in the last few years as well, which we are going to talk about today and focus on more, more recent developments. But just to start off with the background to the original decisions back in 1987, I think, when there was a commission uh, and the world, uh, who was it? The World Commission on the Environment and Development. It was called the Brundtland Commission. I was too young to remember when that started, Bert, but I just, uh, <laughs> just started work. And it's been around a long time. And it brings together a great subject matter of, of business and ethical theory. And it develops aspects of stakeholder theory today and corporate and social responsibility, which were always in my life uh, in investor relations when I started in 2006. Uh, Credit Suisse just before the financial crisis. The concepts are, are broadly rooted in some simple concepts that we've all called previously something known as the triple bottom line. This is when corporates were really trying to focus on environmental, economic and social factors that they could use really to explain their business models uh, better. And they started off explaining those to shareholders initially. And then that has developed more widely into uh, stakeholder reporting more generally. And it's become now effectively um, a sustainability uh, project. Thank you, Steve. Um, you, I'm actually happy that you introduced the topic without too many buzzwords. Uh, so, because uh, that, uh, for a part, takes the people already away because people just use such a jargon that it's difficult to understand. But if you allow me, let's yes. uh, go a little bit and say what does this ESG actually stand for? Uh, why do we need to know more about that? Is this about risk management? What is this exactly about? Yeah, so ESG is a, is an acronym really, and it's it's part of this this what the FT calls this alphabet soup of sustainability that's developed all the way going back really to to the late uh, the the early nineties. So ESG is an acronym for environmental, social, and governance factors. Those are the three key factors today that investment managers are screening and analysing from a quite a large pool of data that now exists in this whole field. Uh, I think it's quite important to remember that the environmental piece uh, shouldn't be confused with the ethical piece, which is a, a slightly older concept. And social often gets confused with sustainable, of course, but uh, it, it's a wider context word that helps understand it. And I think one of the things we'll talk about on the call is, is a concept that we've been using more recently about responsible investments. So, so to me, sustainable finance, sustainable investments are important, but in the pension world that I now work in, uh, as opposed to the investor relations world I used to be in, responsible investment is the really the new uh, the new buzzword. Dare I say it? Uh, so we, we things things finish with RI instead of uh, uh, ESG. So Steve, what is this new buzzword? What is this responsible investments exactly about? What is your new world all about? So, but responsible investing, it's a new approach to investing, really, which incorporates all these ESG factors that we just talked about. This uh -huh. allows us in the, in the investment management world to better manage our risks and to try to generate sustainable long-term returns. In fact, in the UK now, in pension world, it's actually an absolute requirement of our regulator to set out a statement of our investment principles, which are in the public domain. And, and responsible investing now has become so important that the United Nations sets standards for it. And they've become best practice for fund managers. 
And basically, over half the fund managers in the world now have signed up to this uh, statement of principles of responsible investments. And uh, it's very popular. So all the fund managers that, that we use within the pension fund that I'm the chairman of in the UK, they are all signed up to this uh, principles of responsible investment. So to put it simple, it means you're not investing anymore in tobacco companies. You're not investing anymore in casinos. It's interesting. That's really where ethical fund management started by, by negatively screening sectors and excluding tobacco. And of course, that's moved on to armaments. It also now includes uh, fossil fuels um, and it includes other things like gambling and, and pornography where, where, where people are making money. And we've got to make sure that we're not uh, investing in those kinds of socially, uh, those social sectors that might be deemed irresponsible as opposed to responsible. Uh -huh. So sustainable funds really started their lives following on from ethical funds, but they started then investing in new technology. And this new technology was effectively looking for new forms of sustainable energy and recycling and a new technology that's enabling us to um, undertake this kind of Zoom technology, for example, where we don't have to fly to Zurich to give a lecture. I can give it in my front room sitting here, you know, and, and it, Basically, funds in ESG invested in things like Zoom technology several years ago, thinking ahead. What were the challenges to come when we had a lower carbon, a lower carbon economy? Mm -hmm. So how does what is the, actually the impact um, of ESG on, on corporate reporting? Uh, does it mean every company does need to establish now, according to accounting rules, a sustainability report or what are the changes there? So I go back to when I started in Invest Relations. I remember when I joined Credit Suisse, actually, they had some leading edge uh, sustainable reports. And sustainable reporting was very topical. The Dow Jones Index had just created a sustainable index. And mm -hmm. people were, were trying to explain what they were doing that was sustainable. I think in 2007, we created the first global citizenship report, which explained all the social, all the social objectives and, and um, the corporate citizenship that uh, Credit Suisse wanted to do, slightly ahead of its time, but CSR has become a really big industry in reporting. I think its major drawback in one sense is it's a little bit self-serving. To some extent, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's us giving information out as a corporate, and it's not actually audited by, by the audit report on the report and accounts, but a lot of investors have been looking at it for a long time, It's become very, very important, but in fairness, it's created some bad habits. You know, there's a bad habit of what we call over-identification, where some companies want to be so green that they make a lot of promises, and then who checks up whether they do and deliver the promises? And uh -huh. that has created this concept, greenwashing. So there's an element of good and bad in CSR, that, uh, in fairness, has slightly been overtaken now by, by the concepts of ESG and by, by creating these more, more de well-defined pillars of investment management. You know, corporates are able to respond to that in terms of giving more information about the three pillars of ESG and activist investors and proxy agencies uh, are, are collecting that data and challenging management more actively than they've ever done. You know, so um, we've often good companies have always had uh, very good governance uh, procedures and they've explained them usually uh, quite extensively once, you know, at the annual general meetings, but with investor meetings. And that activity has really taken off uh, in the last uh, five to 10 years. Okay, so and it's also related to the SDG goals, Sustainable Development Goals, which uh, were established by uh, United Nations, which uh, SBS is also following because actually it was the students who forced the lectures and the administrations uh, to uh, subscribe to the SDG Accord so that we follow the rules and regulations. Exactly. <laughs> I brought my little prompt with me because people <laughs> say... Can you remember all the 17? And I have to say, I'm, I'm trying hard and I've got more time now to do it. But this little book I picked up, as you know, my last trip uh, to Zurich uh, when we yeah. were at, in January. And uh, yeah, quality education is number four that I know we're working on. Um, exactly. The, the word sustainable only appears once in the list. And that is number 11, which wants to make sustainable cities and communities. Yeah. And responsible appears once actually in the concept of responsible consumption 
and production. So it's sustainability and responsibility, interesting enough, are only two of the 17. And there's some really fundamental concepts uh, in there about poverty and health and, and water and uh, marine life that, that I think people are becoming much more aware of. And by 2030, the only way that we're going to get close to achieving some of those goals is by having more dialogue between corporates and their stakeholders and the investment community through ESG analysis of what they're doing and being held to account. That's the most important thing. How do we hold the corporates that make the promises as investors to account later? And that's a big challenge for all of us in the, in the investment management industry and the pension world. All right. Interesting. Interesting new developments. So since we're talking about quality and education um, and before we talked a little bit about the, the pension industry, what is actually the academic basis for using the ESG in the investment management industry? That's a really good challenge for me to see if I can remember uh, the names of all the papers that we've looked at over the years in this topic. But but fundamentally, there's been a lot of research going back really to the late, uh, the late 80s, early 90s. So I worked in uh, investment management in Barclays uh, in 1997, and we became one of the largest uh, houses for investment called uh, a quantitative house. You know, passive investment management was, was taking off. And uh, we bought a company in California that had leading edge technology and data to drive quantitative techniques. And overlaying quantitative techniques with active management has been a fascinating development in the last 20 years in the, in the industry. And there's a natural tension between the two. And part of that tension is made easier when you come up with quantitative methods to turn passive investment into slightly smarter investments. And we've developed a, a concept now that's quite widely used in the pension fund industry, what's called smart beta. So instead of just tracking the market with an investment that just follows the index up or down, uh, people have clever people have found ways to to outperform that and, and set standards to outperform. And a lot of the researchers looked at that in the context of ESG factors. And in about 2015, there was a major change, I think, when most people realized that there was a very high correlation between the better performing companies in stock market terms and certain of these ESG factors. And governance was a classic one, you know, the better managed companies with the better governance procedures for some reason, seem to be outperforming in some of the analysis. And, and, and typically, as people have followed that analysis through, I think there's a lot of research that proves a better managed company has a lower cost of capital, which is a fundamental way of creating some outperformance. So just looking at the governance factors alone, which people have been doing in fairness for a long time, uh -huh. they do allow you to track if you can set the programs up and, the fa and, get, and get the analysis right, um, some outperformance there. And the same applies to environmental factors and social factors, but these are slightly less developed. You know, it's slightly harder to track the data. And there's a whole industry of, of people coming through now to check that kind of information that people put in their, in their sustainability reports or their CSR reports effectively. Okay, interesting. So uh, we are actually preparing for the, the new world if these are all upcoming industries, which I think uh, COVID will not slash it down. So I don't want to talk no, about wait, COVID. Look, sorry, but one thing I just uh, I forgot to give reference here to one of these key studies. It came out of uh, a big meta study in Hamburg uh, in 2015. Three guys, Frieder, Busch and Basson. And they look back at 2000 empirical studies back to 1997. And they concluded that the, uh, the business case for ESG investing is very well founded. Uh, my only caveat, if you look at the report, uh, yeah. is that Mr. Frieder is actually a, an employee of Deutsche Asset Management. And they, they, they obviously help support the work in Hamburg. But it's quite a good study that is a, a good place to start if you're interested in that kind of thing. All right. Thank you for uh, uh, giving these details. So um, my last question, which I actually have is like, I don't want to talk about COVID all the time, but just like, um, you know, let's see how are these ESG funds? Do you already have an idea that you check upon that? Is it already possible? How did they uh, perform in the COVID crisis? Can we say something about that? Uh, um, or should you recommend to the millennials if they have a little bit of savings, uh, put it in this kind of funds or what would you recommend? Yes, you see, I don't think I can give recommendations anymore in my current line of business, but I, 
I think in the in the pension fund that I I, I, I chair. We spent some time around 2015 looking at some detail in how to manage um, aspects of, of managing uh, our liabilities. So mm -hmm. we did a lot of liability-led oh. investments to protect ourselves from the downsides of our liabilities going up as interest rates go down. And in that time, when you allocate money to that kind of, of hedging, you also have to look at ways you can create growth assets that try to grow quicker than the market. So... It has completely changed our thinking. Uh, the, basically, the global financial crisis made us rethink some of our liability management strategies. This COVID crisis, I think, will have to make us totally reappraise how we use our growth assets. And so in that sense, it's actually a silver lining to some extent, because these assets have typically outperformed in the last two or three years since these studies really have, have turned the tide. And if you look at most perception studies of the industry in the pensions world, we're all doing more ESG investing now than ever. I think the amount of money that went into ESG investing in the States quadrupled in 2019 from, from a wow. low base. In, in, I think it was 2018, it was about five or six trillion, and now it's, it's 20. Or sorry, wow. is that, that billion? Sorry, 20 billion. 20 billion. Yeah, 20 billion is the number. So wow. it's, it's growing quick, but it's still relatively nascent. So I don't think you've missed the boat. I think the challenges are going to be to talk to your fund managers in some detail, to understand the data they use, to understand how they screen the factors, and then they build up uh, portfolios by backtesting these factors. And the, the trick is to make sure that, uh, you know, they are using the right factors and then they're challenging the underlying companies. You know, the data is one thing and the performance on the screen can be backtested. So we've proved it probably 15, 16, 17 uh -huh. um, 18 was a good year really as well and of course now we started 20 with a massive drop and, and unlike any type of crisis I've seen in, in three decades of crises um, the good news is <coughs> for ESG factors they've slightly outperformed in the downside uh -huh. and it's not too difficult to explain one of the obvious reasons is because they're underinvested in carbon, uh, carbon technologies and carbon fuel usage so they're not big in travel companies and they're not big in uh, in planes and and travel so in that sense uh, they've benefited by being slightly underweight in travel and carbon and fuel um, and we have to see how that develops now because we're only sadly you know one month into this economic exactly. crisis come from so it we, so the jury's so out so we can conclude, sorry, we can conclude uh, saying ESG is the future uh, but keep on doing your homework I think the, the need to do homework and become more proactive in it is absolutely fundamental. And uh, it's up to us really as consumers yeah. and in, as investors uh, with our pension funds to challenge both the, the industry that's developing these, these, these data-driven tools, uh, products, and also obviously the underlying co corporates. And there's no doubt that stakeholder activation and challenge and active management is making companies uh, change their behaviors quite a lot. And, and we've seen a lot of that with the green, the green revolution of the last two years. And this will carry on in the other factors as well, obviously. Super. Well, Steve, it's always a great pleasure to, uh, to talk to you. Thank you for enlightening us on this wonderful topic, which I think we can talk still hours about it. But the idea was to introduce it to yeah. our audience, to give them uh, new learning opportunities, eventually new investment opportunities at their own risk if they have done their homework. And let me conclude with the words of these days. Remain rich since you're healthy now. Thank you so much for the talk and have a lovely day. Thank you very much, Bert. Bye. Bye-bye.